Hello and welcome. My name is Dennis Rajesh Tizard and I work here at Labasad. Today we're presenting our masterclass in how to design and publish a visual culture book with Stuart Tolley. At the end of the session, there'll be some time for you to ask Stuart questions. You can leave your questions in the chat on the right, or you can turn on your camera and microphone to ask questions directly. So don't be shy. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our school. We are the only exclusively online design school that has a 100% live format. This gives students an in-person experience in an, in an online format. This is how we guarantee such a unique, high quality learning experience. Here are some key stats about Labasad. 94% of students recommend Labasad. We've had over 3000 students study with us. More than 250 instructors have been professionals currently working in their field. All of our students are from all around the world. We've had students from Germany, the United States, Spain, Italy, Mexico, United Kingdom, and more. Labasad was recently featured in an article on their It's That Nights website, which you can check out on their site. What are the benefits of studying at Labasad? Here are some of them. Our instructors are currently working in the profession, all of them from around the world. We accompany our students throughout the program so they are never alone in their experience. Students can access different opportunities such as workshops, masterclasses, networking, and can participate in awards. We're currently offering three masters. We have our online masters in graphic and digital design, an online masters in graphic design and applied typography, and finally, an online masters in UI and UX design. All of them start in May, 2023. And if you want more information, you can send an email to info at labasad.com. And if you want to know more about us, you can contact us by email, telephone, and on our socials, where you can find our projects from the instructors, the Labasad students, and other news. And now, I introduce you to Stuart Tolley, an art director, graphic designer, and co-director of the online masters in graphic and digital design. Remember that at the end, you can ask any questions you might have about the masterclass in the chat, or by activating your microphone and the camera. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the introduction. introduction. So can I access my slides first up? Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, first up, uh, apologies for the photograph that you saw of me earlier. That was taken a few years ago. Um, I've got my camera on now so you can see, see where I am. So first up, I just wanted to do um, an introduction to myself. So as mentioned, my name is Stuart. Um, I'm an art director, mostly editorial art director. I'm a graphic designer, senior level graphic designer. I'm a university lecturer. As mentioned, I'm a co-director on the Labasad course. Uh, hi, Usha. I <laughs> work with Usha as well. Um, I also teach or have taught at Falmouth University. And I'm also the author of two visual culture books, which are published by Tens and Hudson, um, which is pretty much what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. I'm also the creative director and founder of a graphic design studio called Transmission, which was primarily based in the UK. But a couple of years ago, I uh, moved over to Spain, where I now do a lot of my work uh, remotely. So a lot of the, the work that I do is largely based around the publishing industry. So I art direct, I create books, I create magazines, I create editorials and, editorials and publications. And I mostly work with clients in the arts, culture, lifestyle and publishing industries. I'm also a consultant for branding agencies or corporate companies that want to make editorial and books. So in essence, I love print, I love books, I love magazines, I love independent publishing, and I love the idea of storytelling through books and publications. So for this um, talk, I'm gonna talk about my experience of writing um, the visual culture books, I've written two, and how that has sort of informed my work. 
Um, and I'd want to try and basically the, the process of making a book is really long. It's huge. My first book took me two years. Um, I think I've only got about 30 or 40 minutes on this talk. So I, what I want to do is just try and explain a little bit about how I ended up writing a book and then also just give some tips and ideas and thoughts to anybody who might be um, considering writing a book or a visual culture book. And hopefully it will just kind of um, help you with some ideas and some thoughts and uh, gather some ideas. So as mentioned, I'm the founder and creative director of a graphic design studio called Transmission. And I've written two visual culture books, which are published by Thames and Hudson. So as I said, I want to um, um, my talk is going to focus on how to approach a publisher, um, how to generate ideas for a visual culture book, um, and then just kind of give a bit of a background to the kind of stuff that you probably, well, I didn't, I certainly didn't know about before approaching publishers. So hopefully it will help anybody um, who is considering uh, approaching a publisher about a visual culture book. Now, there are obviously lots of other ways of publishing your own book. Um, there is you know, Kickstarter and self-publishing and funding and getting funding through corporate clients. But I did it a slightly more traditional way by approaching different publishers and then going down a contract and then developing the book um, from there. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about in this session. It's from personal experience. So obviously, you know, some of these experiences might vary. So, you know, if you've got any questions based around, um, you know, the experience that I've done, please feel free to ask at the end. So the first thing I want to talk about is personal interests. Um, sounds really obvious, but I'm a great believer in only doing work in the certain areas that you're really interested in, in, ter in terms of content and also format. So when I was younger, um, the, the thing that got me into graphic design and first interested in graphic design was graphic design for music. So my dad had um, quite a lot of vinyl, had some record collections, and I used to love just you know, looking through them, playing the records, but it was the artwork that really struck me. And this is before I knew what graphic design was. I didn't really know what illustration was, you know. So this is, I was a really, really young age. And this is the first time, this, this screen that you see here is for um, kind of a rock band called Thin Lizzy. My dad really liked the band. Um, but this was the first time I can actually remember being struck by a piece of graphic design. So this was a triple gatefold piece of vinyl. And uh, the area that you see in the middle is actually die cut. So as you open up the, the triple gatefold, there's this massive illustration of the band coming out and it's explosive. The front cover that you see on here is uh, printed black and silver. So it's a really luxurious piece of graphic design and vinyl design. So I love the format. I love the process, you know, and the music. So this is the first time I really remembered graphic design. So I'm very much inspired by, by music and music culture. Um, another area of graphic design that I've studied and interested in, um, when I was studying, I've done a master's and a, a BA as well. Um, an area that really fascinated me was the cross-section between culture, uh, design and music, and also you know fashion and photography and things like that. But it's particularly music, graphic design and culture. So I was really interested. Um, I studied a bit about the punk subculture. Obviously, everyone's aware of punk, but also psychedelia and protest graphics from the late 60s and then post-punk into this sort of slightly more contemporary subculture. So I'm just really interested in how the visual language can be um, created um, to combine with music, combine with fashion and to create a certain energy. So it's the combination of design, music and culture that I, that I really, really love. Um, another area of visual culture that I'm really interested in is photography. I really loved photography when I was younger. It's something that really inspired me. Um, I did a lot of photography when I was studying, particularly in the color and black and white darkroom, experimenting with typography. So yeah, it's just an area that I, that I really, really love. So this is photography by an American uh, photographer called Robert Frank. Um, his work's amazing. He did a book called or a series called The Americans, documenting America in the 1950s. And he also did a lot of experimental work in the darkroom with typography and painting. So this is an area that I really, really love. So I think it was quite natural for me when I was studying to be, you know, considering my interest in music, in graphic design, typography, and also uh, subcultures and print. I was naturally drawn to books and magazines. So when I was younger, I used to really love uh, music magazines, skateboarding magazines, but I suppose the magazine that really caught my attention when I was studying was Raygun. So I'm sure you're all very aware of David Carson and Raygun magazine. 
But the um, designer that I really loved who took over after David Carson was called Chris, Ash Chris Ashworth. Um, his work was really instrumental for me at the time, you know, similar to people like um, Vaughan Oliver, Chris Big, and other designers that were using a more textured approach to graphic design. So again, these are the sort of areas that while I was studying, I was just really, really interested in. And uh, that basically led to me, um, after studying, I moved to London. So I, I just wanted to seek out working in um, independent magazines and independent culture. So I was lucky enough to land a job with a magazine called Sleaze Nation. So working at Sleaze Nation was an absolute uh, baptism of fire for me. I, I got dropped in at the deep end. It was a very small magazine, only a couple of designers, but it had a really good reputation in the UK. It was very much focused on art, culture, uh, fashion, music. So it's everything that I really loved and it won a lot of awards for graphic design and typography as well. So it really was a massive learning curve for me. One of the biggest learning curves I've had in my career. So I worked there for about 13 months um, and then decided to go freelance and then just start working on um, different projects. So since this point, I'd launched a music magazine called The Void. I'd helped launch um, different independent magazines called Disappear Here and worked for brands to um, create independent magazines and books. Um, so it's just an area that I, I really, really loved. And it's something I've always enjoyed working in. I've, you know, I've tried to do other areas of design, but I always come back to editorials. It's something that, that I really love, which is why I want to share with this uh, knowledge and enthusiasm with you today. So one of the first things I really learned as a graphic designer was the importance of working within your personal interests. So like I said before, I'm really interested in photography, design, music, independent culture and subcultures basically is what I, what I really love. Um, when I was quite uh, younger and I've been working a few years in the industry, um, I got a job working at Esquire magazine. Um, now Esquire magazine is, um, if you don't know it, is a really well-known magazine from America. They have different issues from around the world. So it's a really significant magazine. However, they kind of focus on luxury and lifestyle and high-end watches and things like that. And I'm not interested in that whatsoever. And I can, I've been working for 20 odd years. I can absolutely say that the 18 months that I worked there was some of the most miserable that I've ever worked as a designer. It's had nothing to do with the team that I worked with. They were all fantastic and you know, we're still in contact now. It is all about the content. So I think the biggest piece of advice that I could give if you're doing a project, a self-initiated project, or if you're working, is to make sure that you are um, you're connected with the content that's being put out. So yeah, really think about who you are as a person, think about where you want to be as a graphic designer. Also really think about the content that you want to produce, what you're interested in, and how do you want to put it out into the world. So yeah, this is a big learning curve for me. So I was yeah, really not interested in that. So I swore after that point, I'd only work on projects that I'm kind of interested in and um, more like independent projects. So the first thing I want to kind of get across is why on earth did I decide that I wanted to do a visual culture book? Um, as I said before, I'd done a lot of work within editorial. I'd done, designed a lot of books. I'd launched magazines. I'd worked with independent publishers. Um, I've done a lot of work within the editor editorial industry, some of which I really um, enjoyed in terms of the process was really good. Um, and sometimes I felt that I had more knowledge than a lot of um, people that I was creating for. So I kind of just realized that I knew a lot about editorial. I knew a lot about how to make a magazine, obviously knew how to design a magazine because that was my job. So I just, I just started getting more um, confident about the editorial process, some of which I'll uh, talk about later. But it just got to a point where I was just enjoying making, making stories and making books and making projects for other people. But I wasn't making one for myself. I was always designing for other people. So it kind of dawned on me that maybe the next logical progression would be to, to write a book, a visual culture book. Um, I just want to underline that I don't come from an academic background, particularly. I, I didn't do A-levels. I went to art college, sort of a traditional route into design and art. So I definitely didn't come from a writing background. And it was something that um, took a while for me to build my confidence about. But I knew how to come up with ideas. I knew about stories. I knew about ideas. And I knew how to design and produce a magazine and, and a book. So this is just something that felt for me like it was a, a natural progression, it was something that was quite important. So the first thing I would say, if you were thinking about writing a visual culture book, 
is to really identify a subject that you believe in. You know, look again, it comes back to personal interests. Look at what you're interested in. Think about what you're interested in and then build um, a subject area around that. As, as I mentioned before, I'm really um, fascinated with uh, music culture. So I'm, I always bought vinyl records. So uh, when I was looking at an, an idea for a book, I was looking at the music industry. I was looking at patterns within the music industry and particularly within graphic design. One thing that I really did find quite interesting and something that I noticed was the drop in sales of, uh, of vinyl, which led to CDs, but then maybe about 15 or so years ago, there was a rise in record sales. And now it's like, you know, it's very well known that record sales are really big, they've overtaken CDs and downloads and things like that. But this is kind of early doors of that. Um, and this is something that I really focused on and was really interested in, because then obviously that meant that artwork was important again. So instead of looking at a little thumbnail on a screen, um, you know, you're starting to look at big formats. So the design became important again. So this is an area that I, I chose to focus in when started to um, develop ideas for books. So I just started reading, making notes, um, coming up with ideas that are based upon a subject that I'm really passionate about and something I really love. So if you were thinking about writing a proposal for a visual culture book, I would suggest looking at yourself and really, really thinking about what it is that you love and then just looking and reading you know, getting your head around the subject at a really, really early stage. And it'll, it'll help as you progress through the idea. So as I said, with the idea for my first book, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, I, I was really looking at vinyl and vinyl culture, um, you know, graphic design for music. And there was one pivotal moment where I saw and the band Radiohead, they released a record called In Rainbows, you know, quite a few years ago now. But they did something really, really interesting where they released the, the record on um, multiple formats. So it's digital, it was CD, it was all your traditional formats. They, they also did a pay whatever you want for the download. So if you wanted to, you could pay a penny. If you wanted to, you could pay a fiver or a tenner. So it, it kind of showed that on a, grip, a massive scale, just the smallest donation for a download was um, you know, significant in, in a band. Um, however, what they did do to counter that was that um, is, sorry, someone's saying about muting. So um, what I did notice was there's a complete opposite to um, this Radiohead download. They released it in a box set as well. So they released it as a £40 vinyl box set with a book and it was really beautifully produced. Um, and the, the, the thought process behind it was no one's really going to buy it. You know, people like downloads and things like that. But basically, it sold out really, really quickly. So the fact of spending £40 on um, a piece of vinyl, on a book, on a record, was actually quite a significant um, part of the process. And I decided to use this as a cornerstone for my first book. So my first book is called um, Collector's Edition. And um, it is about um, the music industry and record industry and things like that, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. Um, so another way that you can um, sort of generate ideas on personal interests um, is to um, kind of do exhibitions and curate exhibitions. Hi, hey, Stuart. Um, hello. Sorry to interrupt. I think um, the noise might be coming from the microphone rubbing against your, your shirt or something like that. Um, okay. Sorry, I know it's a bit awkward, but <laughs> that's probably what it is. Is it really loud? It, relatively, yeah. Um, okay. But we'll see what we can do. Don't worry about it. Thank you. I'll leave you to it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll put, I, yeah, I struggle with both headphones in, so I put it on the table, so maybe that's what the noise was. Okay, anyway, apologize if that was me. Um, so another way that you can come up with ideas for projects is to uh, curate exhibitions. So I recently designed this book um, for an art. Oh, good, I'm glad it's sorted. Yeah, sorry about that. Like I say, I find it a bit weird with the headphones in. Um, is curating your own exhibitions and projects, which is, this is a book I designed recently for um, a curator based in London. So he'd been curating different exhibitions and um, I designed this book for him. So that's another way that you can sort of generate interest and generate um, curators and things like that is to actually, um, you know, sort of work on exhibitions and start building up momentum that way. So, so these are the key things that you'll need to consider if you are thinking about writing a visual culture book. So these are 
um, the things that I had to do. These are things that I had to write about. So you need to write a biography. So think about yourself, who you are, your career, your design, your process. Write an overview of the book, of your idea. So you need to clearly explain what your idea and what your book is about. So for example, think of it as an elevator pitch. Think about the format. So what size is the book? How many pages? Um, what is the structure for it? And more importantly, think about the structure and the chapters. So this is something to do with pacing. So when you're thinking about making a book or a piece of editorial, you need to think about pace and how that pace works and how you can use double page spreads, single pages, typography to change the pace and the structure. Um, and chapter openers are a brilliant way for um, breaking up the pace. You can be doing a lot of lavish typography and graphic design. Also think about your contributors who you're going to invite um, into the book and think about how um, their interest and their level from around the world. And really importantly is to think about international appeal. When you work with publishers, basically they're going to want to sell the book. You're going to want them to sell the book. And then the bigger appeal that you have an international appeal, the better. So try and think about them and these kind of key key points. So if you are thinking about approaching different publishers, these are just a very short list, but yeah, just do your research, have a think about which publishers you'd like to work with. Um, I was quite lucky when I started doing research, I'm very aware of different publishers and different book publishers. And um, I contacted Thames and Hudson first. I was lucky enough that they got back to me very quickly with my idea. And um, I was able to develop a book for them as well. But other publishers include like Lawrence King. They do a lot of visual culture books, Guest of Tim Prestel, Fiden, Risley, Counter Books and Eight Books. These are all places that you're probably quite familiar with. Now, if you are approaching a publisher, I think the thing to do is to look on their website. Everyone assumed that when I was writing a visual culture book that I knew a person that worked at uh, Thames and Hudson. I didn't. I just contacted them cold and every publisher will, on their website will have um, a piece of information, like a certain document that you need to fill in. So there's certain requirements that you'll need to do. So yeah, make sure you just go to the website, look at the FAQs, look at the contact page, um, and it'll tell you exactly what you need to write. Uh, contracts. So once you've um, been speaking to a publisher and you'll probably go through a few changes, um, the next stage is a contract. So the, this is quite an eye opener for me when it came down to the idea. Um, the, co record, the contract works similar to a record contract in the sense that um, you're paid a percentage of the sales of the book. So my books were selling for like £30. So you get 5% for, of the £30 sales for every book sold, but you only get royalties back once the publisher has recouped its cost. So this is something that people didn't really understand or wasn't aware, of, aware about when they are um, contacting a publisher about the book. It's, the contract is, is quite binding, you know, it, it's quite difficult, but just be aware of the fact that um, you're not going to make a huge amount of money out of uh, publishing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about flat planning. So if you're looking at um, the sort of the design of the book, so before I even consider about graphic design, I consider the flat plan. The flat plan is basically um, a plan, a, um, a way that you can organize the book, the structure of the book and how that works. So I always advise anybody considering making a book, writing a book or a magazine is to be really, really strict about a flat plan. There are lots of flat planning templates online and it gives you an idea about how the book is going to flow. And you, do, you produce it as minis. So a lot of people, when they're making books, they create um, mini printed versions of their book and stick it up on the wall. So I'd advise spending a lot of time on the flat plan just to navigate the structure, to think about chapter openers, to think about what the chapters are, how you divide the book up, and thinking about pace um, and structure. So the flat plan is probably one of the most in, important things that I can suggest that you do. So when you are developing a flat plan and a structure for your book, these are key things to consider. So look at the prelims and the end matter. So the preliminary pages are um, contents page, forward, introduction, end matter being biographies, bibliographies, things like that. Um, think about dividing the book into chapters. So this is all about pacing the book and the structure and how that works. Um, and then, yeah, how can you group, group pieces of work so it makes sense for the reader? Um, once you've decided on chapters, things to consider, such as chapter openers. So, yeah, like I said before, chapters or openers are a really brilliant opportunity to go big and bold and graphic. 
think about pace and structure. So how does how do you use big images? How do you use typography? If you want to do a forward, do you want to introduce anybody into the into the into the book, like a well-known name or a person? And then think about interviews and essays. Do you want to write essays in the book? Are you going to interview people and things like that? So so before you even start on the design process, these are some of the things that I think are really important to consider to help you organize and structure and think about a book. So once you have started looking and thinking about your book, start looking at um, different designers and publishers that work within the industry. So for example, I'm really interested in uh, graphic design for publishing. So look at different studios. So this is a contents example of a contents page. So you can see how um, this book has been broken up into essays, exhibitions and films. So these are different chapters. So this is designed by a studio called Klaus Dew. Um, have a think about chapters. So I said before, um, using big typography and um, lots of letters. So this is uh, more of an essay page, an introduction. Um, this is the Paula Share book published by Unit Editions. So again, it's big, it's bold, it's graphic. It's kind of setting the tone and the visual language for the book. Um, think about chapter openers. So this is for a book about David Bowie, designed by Jonathan Barnbrook. So again, it has this graphic style, big image on the right, lots of big, bold typography. So I think it's really important just to immerse yourself in this whole idea of books, bookmaking. So this is an example from my first book, which is called Collector's Edition. So I wanted to do lots of interviews for the book. It's a, a chance for me to meet people's work that I really love and talk to them about their work. Um, so this, I had an opportunity to work, to go meet Irma, who's a Dutch um, bookmaker designer. If you don't know her work, I'd really advise you to look at her work. It's absolutely incredible. So I met her in the studio, I commissioned photography, and we went over there to, um, to take a look at her work and talk about her working process. So for me, it was, yeah, it was kind of a bit of a, a dream project to do, to do that. So once you've come up with your idea, you've thought about the structure, you've thought about pay, pacing, you've thought about the flat plan, the next thing to do is to step into the world of design. So like I said before, this talk is largely focusing on how to approach a publisher and how to potentially get a publishing deal. The next stage is obviously about design. So this talk is largely aimed at the front end of the process. Um, with the course that I'm going to be teaching at Labasad as well, it'll be much, much bigger process. So we'll go into the design, grids, typeface selection and things like that in more detail. But for this, I just wanted to talk about the process. So a BLAD is a book layout and design. So this is something that you create for the publisher that gives a visual synopsis of your book. And typically they would include the cover, contents page, chapter openers, and a couple of um, varying spreads. So this will give you an opportunity to list who is in the book, um, you know, the contributors, any of the kind of different styles that you want to use, for example, full bleed spreads, um, when to go big on typography and stuff like that. So a blad, a blad is really important. It normally starts after you've done the flat plan, normally after you've done the content list, but it gives you a, an opportunity to, to build up um, the visual language for the book. So this is a blad or part of the design for my first book. So my first book is called Collector's Edition, Innovative Packaging and Graphics. And it is a visual document about vinyl production, but specifically, um, it's about the, the furthest end of uh, vinyl book and publishing. So it, these are really limited edition projects. These are handmade, these are crafted, these are worth lots of money. They're super, super exclusive. And they're basically the complete opposite to down, digital downloads for music, um, eBooks and things like that. So they're basically this super, super high end thing. So this was a, an example of, of how I produce a blad. So you can see a chapter opener on the top left. So I did four different chapters about box sets, um, things created in multiples, um, items created by hand, and then also um, an example of uh, an interview spread. So I interviewed the American photographer, Alex Soff, um, about his, his limited edition books and the process that he goes through, commissioned the photography in America. Um, this is the spread to the top right, which is the In Rainbows box set that I, met, made, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Now, one really important part of this book was if you look at a lot of other visual culture books, they tend to rely specifically on um, existing images. So graphic design studios tend to photograph their books 
but I wanted to do the opposite of that and wanted to make this book a, a still life book. So I actually photographed with a, a photographer, still life photographer, um, every item that featured in the book. So that made sure the background was uniform, the lighting was consistent and the style was right. It was a huge, huge undertaking, but it basically created this uniform feel for the book, which to me makes it really, really um, stand out. So as you can see here, some other um, sample spreads from the book. The, the grid and structure and typography is, is quite rigid. It's quite um, reduced palette, reduced typography. And the key information are um, to provide the reader with the materials used, the print processes used, um, and a bit of information caption about the, about the projects. So another important area within the BLAD and the uh, design process is navigation. So when you pick up a book, you'll largely find that there are different ways of doing navigation. So this is a spread from my second book, which is called uh, Min, the New Simplicity in Graphic Design. So this book is a documentation of uh, the rebirth of minimalism in graphic design, which has occurred over the last sort of 10 to 15 years. I mean, it's moving on now with everyone's talking about maximalism and things like that. So this is a spread of, from, from that book, uh, which is my second publication. So as you can see here, the black stripe down the middle is part of the navigation process, the navigation system. There are many ways of doing that. But I wanted to use the gutter, which is the most kind of the area that nobody touches in a book. It's the bit that you can't see. It's the bit down the middle. So I wanted to use that as a kind of a clever way of using the navigation. So as you go through each of the, the sections um, with the stripe down the middle, you can actually see it on the outside. So the first they're on different tones of gray from light gray to black. So this is actually how you navigate through the book. So thinking about how people use the book, how people pick up the book, how people navigate through the book is really, really important. Um, another consideration is foreign language translation, um, and you have to use black text for this. So this is something that is really important to international publishers. So I said this international appeal before. Um, you have to use text in black. It's like super, super limiting, and you can't use any color. It's because when they print in CMYK, when it's printed, uh, when it's translated into a different language. So my books are prim primarily English language, but they're also translated into French, Spanish, German, Chinese, um, different nationalities. And what the printers do is they take off the black plate and then they replace it. Um, they replace the black, they translate it, replace the black and print it over the top. But because languages have different lengths, if for example, German is, is longer than, than English and vice versa, you must leave a certain space at the bottom. So this is an example here. You have to leave this white gap at the bottom, um, but normally about sort of 10, 15 percent of the, the actual um, the piece. So I created a system, which I'll skip back a little bit, a system of just using text in columns, but having them hanging from the top. So everything is hanging. So it's, it's a kind of accidental amount of white space at the bottom, but it's really important in publishers that they wanna sell books to, to different languages. So this is another consideration. It's really, really limiting. However, I think having limitations is actually quite good because it gives you different ideas and um, different ways of working. So yeah, it's another consideration. So like I said, this is talking more about the process of making a book. Um, and I've done two now. So the first one took two years. The second one took a year and a half. Um, you know, they were incredibly, you know, long process. They were a labor of love. But the things I would say, if anyone was considering about it, is be prepared to give up about two years of your life. So the first book that I did, I pretty much just found this and took on a couple of independent projects just to pay the bills. But it really has to be a labor of love. It's a personal project. The guy that I just designed a book for, which I uh, mentioned before, out of the box book, he wasn't, he was, yeah, he had to give up his work. He had to give up his day job just to focus on this. So be prepared to give up around about two years of your life, a year and a half, two years. Um, next thing to consider is uh, you won't get rich. You definitely don't make much money in publishing as an author. You might make money as the publisher, but definitely not as an author. So again, it's this thing of um, a labor of love. It's something that you really love and enjoy and, and you want to do. Um, and then to do lots of marketing as well. So I know it's nice that was mentioned earlier, but I've done lots of interviews on the radio. I've done lots of um, writing on blogs. I've featured in all different kinds of print magazines. 
Um, I've done live talks, you know, so there, be prepared to do a lot of marketing. You know, once the book is published and printed, people, you want to market, you want to tell people about it, especially if you spent two years working on this project. Um, you, you really want to promote it and market it. And the publishers have a certain amount of experience doing this, but equally, um, you're going to want to do it yourself. Basically, you're going to want everybody to see this wonderful thing that you've made. So it's a travesty if, if they don't get to see it. So be prepared to do a lot of marketing. Um, and the bottom line is, you know, okay, I've talked more about the process, um, less so about the design, which is something I definitely talk about on the course a little bit more. It's a slightly different focus. But the bottom line is, I think I've been working for something like 20 years, but without exception the two books that i've made are the the best things that i've done the best books i've done um i always said after i did the first one i'd never do one again because it was absolutely you know the, the workload was immense and i did everything myself and it was hugely difficult um but yeah i definitely would I absolutely loved it and it was brilliant so when the opportunity came to do my second book the minimalism book um yeah i jumped at it and went for it so if anybody was thinking about doing it obviously i'd be happy to answer any questions about the process and how you go about it but yeah i would absolutely 100 percent recommend doing it um if you were thinking about it um so yeah so that concludes my talk thanks for listening um if you do have any questions then feel free to shout like i said this is more about the process and how to approach publishers as opposed to talking about the design and sorry for uh the noise halfway through like i said i find it a bit weird with microphones on uh with headphones on so yeah apologize for that i hope it made sense in the long run well i think i uh speak for everyone i think i uh speak for everyone still when i say thanks so much because that was really really interesting really fascinating we appreciate you taking the time to um take us through it but this is where we open the floor up to questions so please send them through. You can send them through in the comment um, or you can raise your hand and uh, speak directly. So let's see. Oh, we're a little bit shy today. That's all right. Stuart, I've got a question for you, actually. Go for it. You were talking before about approaching publishers. Could you give us a brief uh, do's and don'ts to approaching publishers? The first thing, the most important thing is go to their website. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is like i said earlier like everyone assumes that you know a contact and i've been i get approached quite a lot by artists and designers that want me to help them get published and they automatically assume that i have a contact or an email address and somebody can just hand it over to and i don't I always say you've got to go to the website you must have a look at the the terms and conditions because every publisher is different um thames and hudson is is quite light but they have they list it on their on their website what you need to do like an overview, think about who you are as a person, a brief synopsis of your idea. But if you want to approach a different publisher, they all have different um, uh, different requirements. So the first thing to do is make sure you've read those. So if you are contacting a publisher, you need to be aware of who they are, what they do, what their output is. Um, there's no point in approaching a publisher if they don't publish books that are in the area of your interest. So if you're looking at Thames and Hudson, they do books about architecture, art, graphic design, photography, that kind of thing. Whereas other publishers um, will have a different, um, you know, a different sort of specialism. So just make sure that you really do your research. You know, you kind of have one crack at this, this presentation. So it's really important that they do it. Um, and get the presentation right. Get people to look at it, check it over before you send it over. They do get back to you. You know, they have publishing meetings maybe once a month, something like that, or more, slightly more frequently. So your book, your proposal will get discussed. So it's really, really important that you do your research and, um, you know, think about what it is that, that you want to say and how, how you articulate that. So those are the things that I'd say for do's and don'ts. Brilliant. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, I love that uh, Martin here has said that uh, they actually picked up the book. They found, accidentally found it at a local library in 2019. So <laughs> hi from <good>. Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah it's good. It does. It's like these books, they kind of, they, the other beautiful side of having these books is the longevity of it. You know, these things exist in the physical space. So people picking it up in libraries, people picking it up in stores, seeing it around is great. And I still get messages from people that, um, I study with and I've worked with and things like that, that actually said these books had a big inspiration on their, their early career as a designer. So it still has this longevity. And that's something that I love about making books as well. The fact that it exists and people respond to it. 
So it's great to hear that people are seeing it and picking it up. Yeah, that must be one of the, the more inspiring parts, right? So you put all this work in, like you said, you have to really be motivated to do it because you're going to give up two years of your life. But then, you know, it was one of the, the cherry on top, right? Just to hear that people have been exactly. uh, really enjoying yeah. it. Okay, so we've got a question here from Matt. It says, um, which is the workflow about color mode? You started the project in CMYK. And what about color mode of your photos? Still RGB or CMYK? So if you're doing a printed book, it's only CMYK. You don't do RGB. So if you're normally, if you're taking photographs, doing photography, it will be um, in RGB, but you must convert it to CMYK before you print. You can't print RGB unless you start using special Pantone colors to try and color match. So always use CMYK. There are different pre presets. So depending on where you are in the world and the printers will advise you so whenever you speak to your printer before you convert any files from CMYK uh, from RGB to CMYK, make sure you speak to your printer and get the print set, uh, the presets off of them. And then you systematically go through making sure everything is to the same uh, preset. Everything has to be 300 DPI for print, unlike digital, which is 72. Everything has to be converted to CMYK because you can't print RGB. So those are the kind of the basics um, for sort of developing and setting up setting up a book so yeah think about uh cmyk no problem it's actually it's kind of th those are sort of basics but um if you want to introduce things like pantone colors and silvers and fluorescence and things like that there are ways of doing it but with a, a mainstream publisher that you have to do all the text in black and they have to whip off the the black layer so um okay there's a few other yeah, let's problem. see. So thanks for the question, Matt. Uh, Chloe says, hello. Sorry if my question sounds silly. It's definitely not. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very beginner. What is the difference between the flat plan and the blat? Okay, flat plan is basically the whole book laid out in um, an organized document. So you could do it as InDesign template. You can do it as Excel. But my books are 288 pages for each book. So what you do is you actually map out the introduction, the foreword, the chapter openers, the, the bibliographies and everything like that, the whole of the 288 pages, you map it out in miniatures, you know, maybe a couple of inches high. Whereas the blad is a visual synopsis of that. So you take um, six or so spreads and you design them full size. So you'll design a few cover options. You'll design a uh, contents page is always a good one because it shows who's, who's actually featuring in the book chapter openers and things like that so it's a what it does is it gives publishers like a visual synopsis it tells them oh i get it i understand this is how you do a sidebar this is how you do a chapter opener and things like that whereas a flat plan is everything every page mapped out but not designed so hopefully that makes it clear they're both massively important parts of the process before you even get into design they're like super super important so they're worth spending ages on Brilliant. Thanks, Chloe. Um, we've got two questions here. I can see, Juan, you've got your hand up, but I did see that uh, Eduardo came in first. So Eduardo says, hey, Stuart, which is the most important element in your editorial projects? The first thing you have to think about before starting a project. Thanks. Concepts. It's all about concepts and ideas for me. Um, the way that I approach graphic design, um, when I'm thinking about a brief, it's could either be my projects or working with um, corporate clients or publishers is I really love a tiny little twist. So I, my work is quite stripped back. I really love using photography. So I don't want to put lots of big type all over photography and things like that. So my approach is quite stripped back. So I'm thinking about typefaces, the grid systems and things like that. But what I really, really love is like a little twist, a little something. So in my talk, I explained about the navigation for my second book, Min, by using the gutter. The navigation is like a colored strip or a black strip right down the middle. Um, I'd never seen that done, uh, that sort of navigation system before. It's just no, I've never seen it done. And the publisher had never seen it done before. But it's an idea that I had years ago, but it never, it went, it never really went through. So that to me is like a really lovely little twist. You know, the way that you navigate the book is you look outside the book to then see the color strips and that's how you, you engage into it. Um, so that, that was quite good. And in the first book uh, with collector's edition, that book is all about limited edition, um, 
you know, music packaging and book publishing and stuff like that. And that normally as an artist, you addition your print. So you'll do one of 100, two of 100, three of 100. And the standardized format for doing that would be have the addition number, a, a vertical slash, and then the, um, the addition number at the end. So one out of 100, et cetera, et cetera. So I did that for the, the page numbers for collector's edition. So every single page was one out of 288, two out of 288, because that was the amount of pages that were in the book. So it's almost saying that every single page in this book is an edition number within itself. So again, that's something I'd never seen done before. It was uh, a new idea to me. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't approached it. So it's just these little these little twists that uh, the reader might not see straight away or might not understand straight away. Um, that's that's something I really strive to do for every project. It's like this hidden element. They'll come back to it and then they'll see it and they'll get it. So that that to me is like probably the most important thing that I do whenever I take on any project is try and find a whole new way of, of looking at a very simple um, element of design. Excellent. Uh, Eduardo, thank you for the question. And so Juan, please ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Hi, Stuart. I uh, really love the master class. Uh, I got a question. Well, I was very intrigued by how the whole process when you I love how space is an important element in every design of the of the books that you do. And I wanted to ask you, what's the part that you enjoy more when you design a book, like from designing the colors, the fonts, and how everything's going to be structured or or something? <laughs> so I think for me, it's and again, it's the concept, thinking about the concept. But I really love the the Blad stage. So you've thought about your flat plan, you've thought about the idea, you've got this um this concept you thought about the flat plan and how the book might look and think about it but when you actually come to the blad it's this initial playfulness that you can have so i might be thinking about an idea in my head um and it's getting it down on paper and thinking about it that way so for me it's the the blad process it's not like it's going to sound considering the amount of time that i spend designing these things it's almost like once you've got the blad down and like you're really happy with it and you love the design, you love the typography, you love the elements, the grid, the structure, everything like that. Once you've done the blad, it's almost kind of wheeling it out to this process. So the exciting part for me is the blad. So I really, I'm very, I'm, I love typography. I'm really interested in typography. So I spend a lot of time researching typefaces that I think suit and match the book and also work well together as pairs. And then the grid system, the stuff that you don't really see, like the grids and the structure of it is really, really important as well. Just so that when you're creating a page, they help you or work with you. Um, a certain alignment that I did throughout the books um, that you, the reader just wouldn't notice. But it's just about, again, it's creating this simplicity. So the grid is really important. But the, for me, it's the blad. It's bringing all of these elements together, all your ideas together, and then starting the design process. That's the bit. I'm a designer by heart, you know. So that's that's the bit that I that I really really love. Great, thank you thanks, very much. Stuart. So, sorry, Juan. <laughs> so we've got our last question here, I think, from Inda. Um, I'm not sure we can do this, but um, oh, okay, one more. Um, Inda says, can you show some examples in your book, like sorting? done while keeping in mind the principles of design? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. So no problem. Um, Indar, if you can help us a little bit with what you mean, um, no worries if not. And we'll go to Bell, um, who's got the, the hand up. Thanks a lot. Bell, please go ahead. Hi, I was having some slight technical difficulties. Um, can you hear me OK? We yeah. can, yeah. Cool. Um, I have kind of a dumb question, possibly, but what exactly counts as a visual culture book as opposed to like just a book? Um, a visual culture book is about visual culture. So it's uh, about photography, favorite. fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also think coffee table books. Gotcha. So it would be large format, more pages, big images, luxurious typography, as opposed to, um, you know, like a a paperback or something like that, which would just be typeset. You'd have a book cover, which is illustrated and then typeset in the middle. So I think, yeah, I think large format coffee table books about art and culture. That's that right, would be visual like culture. Bespoke. That makes sense. Yeah, um, I mean, they I could be, second... yeah, yeah. Sorry, carry on. Sorry. No, I was just saying like, if you think, so it's not necessarily bespoke, but it's more like, for example, Fiden and Thames and Hudson, they print books in the thousands, you know, they really, really do. So it's more like format, large format and 
um, print, you know, illustrated, essentially, photography and illustration. Gotcha. Um, and then you were talking about, um, I think you were talking about your first book, and you said it's really important to have like a uniform feel for the book. Um, when you think about your design specifically, are you approaching it more like as a graphic designer or, or an art director? Because that's more of an art direction job, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm both. So I'm yeah. a graphic designer and an art director. So when I looked at this project particularly, or both books actually, I, I approached it as an art director. So I was commissioning photography throughout. So every mm -hmm. single item that featured in the book was photographed. So the art direction was very heavy. I was work. I built a set. Uh, we got the lighting. I worked with the photographer, and I was very prescriptive about the angles that we would take in the shot, what the lighting was like, particularly the shadows. And I tried mm -hmm. to spend a long time reducing shadows. Um, so that was the heavy art direction side of it. When you put it into the into the page and into the layout, that's when the design comes into it. So I'm looking at the composition, the grid, the structure. Um, and how best to use use images. So I, I did both um, for both books. The second the second one that I did, I actually photographed myself as well. So I did the still life photography, art direction, and the graphic design. So I added another hat or another layer of my work uh, into the project. So, but it gave me the complete control essentially. I, I sound like a bit of a control freak, but it was just like it was heavy art direction, very heavy art direction. But, so yeah, would you say like? Stuff if you're coming from a more, more of a graphic design background you could don like the art director hat um, and it would be an important thing to do um, in this kind of project to have that unity and that cohesion yeah yeah definitely I think for me working in editorial you, you know you, you work as a designer but the natural progression is then to work as an art director and then mm -hmm. you can go to creative director level so I love working with photography I love working with illustration I love coming up with ideas so that once you start commissioning and telling people that you're commissioning what to do because you have this idea, that puts you into art director territory. And that's where I, I really love. And then you bring it back onto the page and you do the design. But for me personally, I really, I get it, re I find it really rewarding commissioning people, working with people, experts, you know, photographers, illustrators, um, and then working with them for your, your idea to realize your ideas. Very cool, thank you. <laughs> No problem. Thanks for your question, Bell. That was great. And so, yeah, Indar, sorry, um, we couldn't quite answer your question there, but um, I think after this masterclass, you can see why we're so happy to have Stuart on as the co-director of our graphic and digital design masters. Um, but that will do, do us for today. Um, Stuart, did you want to say anything before we go? Not really. Just firstly, thank you very much for uh, showing up. Again, apologies for the sound issues um i'm very much looking forward to working with you guys you know dennis i know we've spoken before but uh, working with everybody at that was sad so yeah i'm really excited about that and also sort of you know sort of handing over my knowledge but firstly lastly thanks to everybody who's here particularly those for asking questions really appreciate it no no thank you and thanks everyone for coming and uh, we hope to hear from you soon here at lava bye for now <laughs>